is difficult to imagine a world without plastic. Our lives and our economy have become so much dependent on plastic today. And that is a problem. Our over-dependence on plastic, coupled with not so considered disposal methods, has resulted to a global problem that is plastic waste. That's correct. So much plastic in the oceans, so much plastic in the drainage channels, which often leads to flooding. And now the planet is looking for solutions for more sustainable production, more sustainable consumption. Hi, my name is David Owino. And I'm Juma Majanga. Welcome to Africa Development Journal, a premier audiovisual journal of Africa's development journey. And on this first episode of the Africa Development Journal, we bring you the story of a young girl in Kajiado County in Kenya, who is doing her bit in fixing the plastic waste problem. Here is a global problem in the hands of a nine-year-old. Let's watch her story. Plastic, a commonly used material in almost every household, but one which can also be detrimental to the environment and pose serious threats to lives and livelihoods. If you disintegrate the plastic, actually, it's more than 2,000 chemicals. It has been termed as a global problem that affects every single person in the world. What makes plastic being an issue now? It's the single-use plastics. Some ending in the field, uh, reducing the permeability of water to the soil, making the tree grow more challenging, then exacerbating also the drought when it's rain. All the drainage are blocked. It's exacerbating floodings. And since, unfortunately, these plastics is not something that our body, our systems can digest, then he get through our system and unfortunately, he, he became a poison. Ongata Rongai is a rapidly growing town in Gajiado County, 13 kilometers from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. With a bulging population of approximately half a million and lack of proper planning, plastic waste management is a huge challenge here. Anton Baraza is a waste collector in Kajiado County. Wakati naanza kasi, uwa na, naenda na ayo, ata nikiangalia nyuma, ata kabla sianda 100 meters, nikiangalia nyuma hivi kuna machupa tena sinesha tukutupa tano. Nikama penye sijatoa, sasa hii story ya plastic imekua too much. Ata tumeshindo ya tutakontrolo aje upande wa plastics. Remarkable efforts have been made by different stakeholders in tackling the problem of plastic waste. But perhaps it is time to tackle the menace from where it begins, at home. As Kenya prepares to host the fourth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, Zulani TV has come to Ongatarongai to meet a young girl whose initiative is a big leap towards winning the fight on plastic menace and helping keep the environment clean. My name is Ariana. Maho, Ogada. I'm nine years old. I'm in class four. Disturbed by the effect caused by plastic waste in her home and school environment, Ariana Maho decided to take action and do something to make the environment better. Every morning as I go to school, I see I see plastic bottles being removed in the trenches. And every evening as I come back, I find plastic bottles in the trenches. Often it rains and water can't flow. It means we can't play beyond our little compound. It means the compound smells bad. I told my mother I don't like it. She told me then do something. The nine-year-old who loves planting trees uses plastic waste from her household to make flower pots and has turned her parents' balcony, which is also her working station, into this beautiful flower garden. And her work is amazing. She asked for my laptop again. She went through, I think, researching. I don't know what she was researching. And she came up to me and told me, you know what? I have this idea. And I think I'll recycle these plastic bottles and I'll come up with very beautiful flower pots. I was shocked with her work. I didn't know that she could use my old nail polish. She could recycle this. This I would actually, when they're dry, I would throw them out. No plastic leaves her home, she tells me. Everything is recycled. 
from small water bottles to large containers like this to a mom's dried up lipstick all find use. The results? These magnificent flower pots. Ariana knows that the impact of her work alone will not be enough to keep the environment free from plastic. She encourages and teaches other kids to do the same so as to widen the impact. I need to make sure that no plastic leaves the house as waste. I, I, I told my friends to do the same. They are actually emulating what she's doing. They are making plants as well. They are recycling plastic and they are even coming up with more better ideas. It's a playful project, I think, and kids find it fun. And I believe it starts small, but it grows big. It'll make a change in future. This is a long-term investment. According to the UN Environment State of Plastic report, the world produces around 300 million tons of plastic every year, out of which only 14% is collected for recycling and only 9% of the total plastic produced until 2018 has been recycled. To have a successful recycling program, you need to have a very, very strong uh, collection uh, scheme. And this is not always the situation. The challenges also of recycling is depend also on the price of a, of a primary resin. And the, the price of primary resin is also depending on, on the price on the international market of oil and gas. For example, if the, the, prim, the price of primary resin is too low, recycling becomes a challenge. Waste generation in Africa, like in other developing regions in the world, is driven by population growth and rapid urbanization. The management methods are, however, severely inadequate. More than a half of the generated waste is disposed of on the street, roadsides, open spaces and stormwater drainages, water bodies and through burning, which results to serious health and environmental consequences. When you burn plastics, you are producing very, very toxic uh, chemicals. You will pollute the air and pe people are breathing the air. So it's end up at uh, increasing the number of uh, maybe uh, health problems like uh, asthma, like respira respiratory health issues, even cancer. Kenya is one of the first countries in Africa that banned usage of plastic bags in effort to mitigate the effect on the environment. The impact of that ban is however yet to be felt as loads and loads of plastics still find way to the environment. Africa aspires to be recycling at least 50% of our waste by the year 2023. For this to happen, a combination of local small-scale community-driven initiatives like Ariana's and large-scale high-cost public-private initiatives are required. At times they see people just drinking water and they comfortably throw plastic and garbage out the windows and that is okay with them. So I'm thinking when we start with kids at this age, at this tender age, they'll grow up knowing that it's not good to throw away to litter, I mean, our environment. If we can manage to dispose in a very sustainable way the plastic that we are, that we are handling, if you can choose not to use a single-use plastics, if each consumer can just think twice and say, if I cannot reuse uh, tools, if I cannot reuse uh, cups or glasses, etc., then I will not go for it. It will be a tremendous contribution of each individual to solve the plastic pollution. For Ariana, though, it is much more than just play. I don't plan to stop. I plan to save and one, and one day this can be a big company. You can see these are very beautiful plants. And um, I came up with a prize and I told her, you know what, this can be this much, this can be this much. And it happened. It's now a business. Ariana's major focus, however, remains in keeping the environment clean by keeping plastic waste away from it. This, she knows, will require massive investments and novel partnerships to accelerate her initiative. At only nine years of age, the young girl Ariana should be the least person to blame for the plastic menace. She has, however, taken full responsibility and, in her own small ways, recycling one plastic at a time to help keep the environment clean. For Africa Development Journal, I'm Juma Majanga. 
And that reminds me of that famous quote, that let everyone sweep in front of their house and the world will be a clean place. Exactly. But a nine-year-old doing this is quite impressive, which makes me want to go back in time and ask you, David, what were you doing at nine? What was I doing at nine years old? Yeah. Nothing that would interest your audience. <laughs> and so we just need to move on to the next story. Our next story is about money. And I like this story because of its ground level approach in solving community problems. That's true. Here is a community that could literally run out of money. And so we could have a situation where there are goods and services available. And there are people, many people, who are in need of these goods and services. But in a situation where there's no money as a medium of exchange, the economy would literally ground to a halt. And so they made their own money. And that is not even the full story. Mm -hmm. From five different informal settlements across Kenya, we get to see how digital currency can work at community level and the transformation that will bring to life and business. And here's the story. East Africa's largest metropolis, Nairobi, is a city on the move. The skyline is quickly evolving. More multinational corporations are setting up here and the population is swelling by the day in a race for opportunity and profit. Out in the city's markets, it's survival for the fittest. Money determines the success of enterprises here. There are big businesses with many big clients, but there are also small-scale traders operating in the city's informal settlements. Over half of Nairobi's population live in the informal settlement. These are areas where at times neither the business nor the customer has the money to effectively engage in trade. Many are the times in such neighborhoods when the people are completely out of money to spend even on their most basic needs like food. In such times, the local economy grounds to a halt. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And I get a fork with it? Okay, you run a fork. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So in order to find their way into the main economic playground, traders in some of Nairobi's informal settlements introduced just what they did not have, money in the form of community currencies. That was five years ago. Some of these retailers, they are low income traders and uh, they need to trade on a daily basis. They depend on volumes to make something at the end of the day. So how do we increase that trade volumes? That's where the idea of community currency comes in. At least within the first few months, 20-30% increase in trade. And after a year, we're seeing even up to 100% in some businesses. So they get more clients, they're more stable as a market, and they're still using Kenyan shillings, and this fills the gap that's missing. Through the experiment and experience of five years in close to 10 communities across the country, Sarafu Credit is now ready to transform into a community-level digital currency, and rightfully so. Digital currency is just like a normal currency. The only difference is that it's not physical. It's more or less virtual. And it's mostly because they want to make it kind of cross-border transactions. You don't necessarily need to be, you know, uh, within one border so they can use them. You can be in Kenya, you can use it someone in China, in the US. The idea is that if this is an app or a service on your phone, that anyone could not only have access to it, but also create now their own networks. So that's the, the dream there, is to, is to really make it so easy to use and so easy to... Uh, to integrate into, into people's daily life. The digital currency that these communities seek to create is based on a platform called Lev Market, which is being used by communities in Israel. Now, you could think about Lev Market as Facebook, because users can join existing communities or existing trading networks the same way you can join a group on Facebook. Or they can create their own trading communities. Now, when you create a trading community, the platform gives you an opportunity to create also a currency with which you will trade within that network. 
in Israel, for example, we have 20,000 mothers that are exchanging hearts on our digital platform. Every mother can say everything she needs and the whole community is helping. Every uh, person can say what he has to give. And the result is that mothers save 25% of all their expenses uh, that they not, don't need to pay now with shekels, they pay it with hearts. And they also can afford things they couldn't afford before. Just like their paper currency, which they use in complementarity with the Kenya shilling, the digital system will enable multiple wallets, including credit cards and mobile money. I can easily buy products and services within this community, even though I'm not a member of the community. I don't really need to go somewhere and look for Lindy Pesa so that I can do it. I can do it right there. So what does that do? It just increases the market size that the guys in the Lindy community have access to. And once you widen that scope of access to products and services, you're basically improving the lives and services of the guys within the community. In terms of security, it's, it's a bonus actually, to especially the women who are mostly involved in the communities. Because they're able to move around with value, with money, but not necessarily in physical form. And if someone's going to steal, they want to steal the physical money. The platform itself is very technologically strong. For you to hack through it, you really need to be extremely technologically smart. In fact, it bears real cost reduction benefits as well as opportunity for easier and quicker replication. To print a currency is not trivial, right? Um, you need to have special paper, you need to have security features. It's expensive to print. Um, and so, you know, and we're, we're having to print right now, we actually, uh, we get the paper from the Netherlands, it's printed in Germany, it's shipped down here. The challenge of printing these vouchers for every single community now in Kenya becomes a, a burden. And so in some ways we're looking at kind of two levels where we have the ability to um, invest and integrate between networks with a cryptocurrency, but within the community we have a uh, a sub cryptocurrency, right? It's, it's their cryptocurrency and that becomes much, much faster for them. And, you know, the benefit of it is that we can create these systems with cryptocurrency such that, that they're secure and totally transparent. The good thing with the digitizing them is that you're more or less putting them on a blockchain. And when you put them on a blockchain, it just means that they're going to be permanent data stored there. It's very difficult to manipulate that data. So, you know, the normal paper currencies that we use, it's very easy. We can print more and cause inflation and stuff. With digitization, that problem is totally eliminated. If and when successfully implemented, the digitization of these community currencies will be a major leap towards deepening financial inclusion, not just in the current implementing communities, but in the whole country. It will be an initial infrastructure on which more innovations could be plugged in the future. When you put money in the hands of communities, you effectively create demand for local products and services. What that means is that much more trade can happen at the local level. So whether digitally or with paper vouchers, these communities are focused on trading their way out of poverty. So David, at a time when crypto is crumbling in stories of lost investments, we get to see hope that financial technology is bringing to these poor communities. That's correct. The brilliant part of this story is where they move to digital because we are talking about a community that is already cash deprived. Yeah. And so you do not want a solution that makes you use so much money in creating money because money really is the problem. True. And that's important. Yeah. yeah. And on that note is where we come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching Africa Development Journal. See you next time in another exciting episode. Until then, I'm Juma Majanga. And I'm David Owino. Thank you so much for watching. Let's keep innovating. Let's keep creating. Let's keep building. See you another time. Ciao.